Okay, so that's me. I'm Batman on IRC. Um, my uh, my real name is uh, Jan Henning Thorsen, and I work for a Norwegian telecom company uh, called uh, Telnor. So about the XML SOAP thing, uh, we have a malicious server there that uh, renders around 20 million uh, SOAP documents, uh, non-blocking, uh, per day. And it's uh, using Redis as a backend, and uh, we don't care about VSDL or whiz Whizzle or whatever you call it. <laughs> uh, so we just hard code the templates. So we kind of brute force the, the routers and figure out what they really want, and then we just write the XML in, in a regular template because it's so much faster than, than using something to actually generate the, the XML. Okay, so uh, I'm really happy that you're all here, and I'm really glad that we managed to pull together the first Modulicious uh, conference. Um, yeah, and I'm here about um, the uh, plugin called Asset Pack, uh, which can help you help you minify um, files. But I will, yeah. So <clears throat> through the talk. Whoops. Um, I'm going through what the plugin can do, how it works, and how we can extend it and use it for custom things, if you like that. And then I'll also talk about some gotchas and extensions. OK, so what is an asset? An asset is pretty much any static file, like a JavaScript file or a CSS file. That's the main things that Asset Pack can handle now, but it could also, in theory, uh, handle uh, images or any other static asset that you might have. Um, so the thing about the, the assets that you're actually working with is that it, you usually split them up and you make them readable. So you put on like readable variables names in your JavaScript and you indent it and make it all uh, readable. But the browser doesn't really care about that. I mean, if, if the browser looks at a variable and it's called A instead of uh, my name, for example, it, it can still do the same thing. So, but it's really good to minify the files because then it will uh, be uh, downloaded faster by the browser and it will also be executed faster. Um, and also, uh, another thing about having many assets is that the, the browser has to uh, download many of them, so it, it, it makes it even slower because of the round trip. And the browser can only do so many requests at a time. So you just want to pack everything into one file and then get the, down, get the browser to download that. I know there are some people who really like to like, lazy load JavaScript files. I can't see, say I'm a big fan of that, personally, because I just want to have everything in one big file. But if you're working with a megabyte of JavaScript, then you might want to split it up. OK. So this is like a really simple way to look at how the asset pack is working. So what you do is that you, you define uh, a group of files, and then you run it through a preprocessor, and then you get one file uh, in the other in the other in the other end. So um, <clears throat> the uh, preprocessor can be anything you define, but um, uh, bundled with the asset pack, you get preprocessors pre for CSS and JavaScript. So in the example here, you have one plain CSS file, and then you have one less file, and you have one SAS file. I'm not sure if you're familiar with SAS and less, but it allows you to put logic into your CSS. But then you have to run it through a program which actually generates the CSS. So if you're still writing pure CSS, I really, um, I really recommend checking out, for example, SAS. Um, 
So there are some bundle preprocessors. Um, the uh, the asset packs. Um, uh, it it uses CSS minifier access to to cram together the CSS file to minify it to to remove to remove white space and such. Um, it also uses JavaScript minifier access to to minify the the JavaScript, like shortening variable names and um, private methods and stuff stuff like that. Uh, the access modules require you to have a compiler, but it but I chose them anyway because they are really fast compared to the pure Perl versions. Um, and then there's some optional uh, requirements, and that is the less executable, if you want to um, compile your less files. And then uh, there's some guy who wrote the extension for, uh, or made a preprocessor for CoffeeScript, if you like to write that. And then there's us. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, we've chosen to use the actual binaries instead of the CPAN modules to minify or to uh, compile less and SAS. And the reason for that is that the, the CPAN modules is simply not good enough. They are not fast enough to keep track of the changes. So if you really don't want to install Ruby or Node or something like that, then, you're, then you have to pr uh, define your own preprocessors. Okay, so let's show how you can define an asset. So this example is going to use a modulicious light uh, application. Um, next, you have to load the plugin. And the plugin is meant to uh, have sane defaults. So usually you don't have to give it any options, but there are some options uh, like decisions on when to minify or not. After that, you define your assets inside your application. And the reason for that is that the assets are, are, um, uh, they are minified or they are run through less or something like that on, on, um, on startup. So once the users are, are requesting the, the files, they are already compiled or created into one, one asset. So in the example here, we just uh, use a domain name for, for the actual asset that we want to reference to later. So that's uh, myasset.css. And then we uh, um, define a bunch of files which, are, uh, which has to be located into your public directories or into your somewhere where the static renderer can find. So these files can also be accessible by typing the direct URL, if you like. Um, and someone might want to move them elsewhere because they don't want the user to actually see the readable source. But uh, I think that's pretty stupid, so I just did it this way instead. So the myasset.css file is going to be uh, a combination of the impress demo CSS file and the presentation presentation.scss file, which is a SAS file. And then at the end, you start your application, and it's going to find the files, and it's going to uh, make the a the assets that that the end user is going to download. So in your templates, uh, you have to uh, create JavaScript files or, C or style tags to uh, include the actual assets. So instead of writing in those manually, you can just say, use the asset helper and then um, point to the friendly name that you defined earlier. So here we are using myasset.css 
and it will generate the actual tag that you have to use or that points to that file. So this is more like a virtual file more than it's an actual file. Uh, when it comes to defining assets, there's this really cool feature that I like is that you don't have to just point to files that you have created yourself. If there is some file on GitHub or in some CDN, you can, you can just reference to it by the, by the URL. And Asset Pack will download those files and then cram it into the resulting file. So here is the, the domain name is bundle.js. And it will include three files from, um, from the Cloudinary, or two files from the Cloudinary CDN. And then it will include the jQuery, uh, jQuery library. And then at the end, it's going to include the myapp.js, which is uh, some file that you have created yourself. Oh, that was really <laughs> difficult to read. Um, so on my left, it says development in the pink square. And on the right side, it says production inside the blue square. So the thing is that it would be really annoying if you had to go into your templates and then uh, define all of, your, uh, all of the files you are working on, because when you do development, you really want to have readable JavaScript, for example, because if the browser says there's an exception on line 200, uh, you can go into the file and you, can, and you can figure out what's actually going on there. So when you're in production environment, it's, it will cram it, the files into one single line. So uh, the browser can download it faster. But if you're in development mode, then it will actually expand all of the assets or uh, the, let's say, all the script tags into all of the uh, tags that you, or all of the scripts you are pointing to. So if you look at the bundle.js example, in development mode, mode it will actually make four script tags, um, which include the, the, the source that you point it to. Um, there is one thing, though, that if you're using CoffeeScript or SAS or something like that, uh, like that, then you still have to somehow backtrack where the where the bug is, uh, because the the generated file might not be exactly like the, your source file. Mm, there was another contribution where you can set uh, the Mojo Asset Pack no cache environment variable to a true value, and that will um, force uh, the, for example, Morbo or something like that to to generate the the files on each request. So there's two ways of doing this: is that let's say if you're changing the uh, the JavaScript files then you could use the dash w uh, switch for Morbo, so it can watch the, uh, your public directories as well. And then when you save that file, it's, it will reload the program. But instead of telling Morbo which directories to, uh, to uh, watch, you can just set this environment variable instead, and it will always generate a new file on each request. OK, so what about the, the generated files and the general file structure? So in the beginning, I said that the, the files, your source files, are available um, somewhere where your static renderer points to. 
and that's usually in your public directory. So you might have some files under public CSS and public slash JS, which is the files you're working on. But then a new directory, which is called packed, is created by the asset pack plugin. And under that directory, the output assets will go. So um, instead of some asset here, it will be a name, for example, my bundle or something, um, something that you define as the friendly name. And then it, you will have a dash, and you will have a MD5 sum, which is the, the sum of all the input files. So that means that every time you change your input files, it will generate a new packed file uh, with a new MD5, MD5 sum. And the reason for that is because when a new visitor hits your, um, hits your app, you want to be absolutely sure that they don't know the new version and not the old one. So there are some ways. Uh, I'm not sure, but there are some other libraries that just put on a query string, and then you have like a timestamp or something like that. But there are some browsers that doesn't care about the query strings. It will still use the old version. But since you have the MD5, then you're then you're always uh, certain that the user will download the exact file that you want them to. And also the old visitors, which might have the HTML uh, in the cache, they will point to the old file. Okay, so internally, how, how does it set up, how, how does Asset Pack know how to process the different kinds of subfiles? So the thing is that if you don't give it any options, it will do some auto detection to figure out if you have less uh, installed or SAS or do you actually have the required CPAN modules. So if you, if you have the required uh, executables installed, then it's going to do uh, call the preprocessor um, object and then call the add method on that. And then, in theory, you should be able to define your own preprocessors as, as well. So let's say if you want to minify all your JPEGs, so you have your team of uh, designers who don't really care about 10 kilobytes or 120 kilobytes or one meg of JPEG, then you could, in theory, just receive anything, and then you could run, and then you could add this preprocessor, and you could crunch that JPEG, like remove all, all the data that you don't care about, and then get a really small and nice JPEG. Um, there's a, I think it's a jpegmini.com or something like that, that is really good at crunching JPEGs, so I would really like to like, tap into that because it's so boring to, to go into the editor and, and do this uh, job by yourself. <clears throat> okay, so about the arguments. You say the first argument here is JPEG, and that's the file extension. So the asset pack will look at the file you want to crunch, and then it's going to look, okay, this is a CSS file or a less file, and then it's going to re re run it through all the preprocessors that is defined for that file. So the data variable here is a scalar ref to, the, to all the data that is inside that file. So let's say if you have a 10 meg uh, JPEG, then that reference is going to point to 10 megs of JPEG data. Also, you can run the add method as many times you want. So let's say you kind of like how less is, um, is converting less files into CSS files, but you don't like how it minifies them. You can add your own preprocessor, which is chained to the, to the predefined one. So then you could use the binary to convert it into CSS, and then you could crunch it by your own logic.
OK, so let's say if you don't like the predefined processors, then you can define your own. What you have to do first is to call the remove method, because as I mentioned, the, uh, the pro preprocessors are chained together. So you have to remove all the definitions, and then you can add your own. So here you might use some other, like the non-excess uh, CSS minifier, and, and use your own instead. Um, this is probably nothing that you want to put into your actual code. So, but it's just here for an example. The thing that you can see is that how you can assign things to the scalar ref, and it will be the resulting, uh, resulting data that is uh, written into the, into the packed directory. OK, but there are some things that it doesn't solve. One issue with the packed file lines is that, as I said, it's, it, it has the friendly name, and then it has the MD5, MD5 sum. The problem is with that is, let's say, if you're using SAS. The thing about SAS is that you define like your main SAS file, which includes other SAS files. So, uh, asset pack today will only read the top level uh, SAS file. So let's say if you have some, uh, like in Bootstrap, you might have a variables.sas file, and if you change the color in that file, you have to actually make some dummy modifications to the top level file as well. So if you wonder why there's no changes, that's probably it. So one thing that I do while developing is that I always remove the files in, in the pack directory first, and then I uh, rerun, uh, rerun asset pack on each uh, reload. OK, so why would you like to why would you like to use this module? So the thing is that you avoid the caching issues. So let's say if you have app.js that you're including all the time, and you make some changes, then the end user might not see the new file. But because you add the MD5 uh, sum to the file name, you will always make sure that the end user are downloading the news file. And then in production mode, it will be minified, so you use less bandwidth and it will load faster in the browser. And the end result is that you, you will serve all your web pages faster. OK, so if you start using Asset Pack and you, you like it, then I would encourage you to, to make bundles or extensions that can be downloaded from CPAN. The thing is that for, for example, Ruby, there's like include bootstrap or include foundation or include jQuery, and it just works. And I would really like to have the same functionality in Perl. So you say that, OK, instead of downloading jQuery, you can just say use jQuery or something like that. And it will, be, and it will automatically be part of your program. So. I'm using Bootstrap a lot, so I created a plugin called Bootstrap 3. And it uses Asset Pack underneath to do all the things to, to pack, pack the SAS source files into the Bootstrap CSS file. Um, so let's say if you want to have Bootstrap, you can just use that plugin instead of downloading Bootstrap or cloning the Git repo or doing all the crazy stuff that you have to do to, to actually get Bootstrap into your project. So it also, since it's uh, using the SAS version of Bootstrap, you can go in and customize everything you like. So Bootstrap is really big if you use the default settings. But let's say if you have no forms on the web page, then you can go into the plugin and you can customize it and say, oh, I don't care about forms. 
or I don't care about uh, buttons, for example. And then you get a smaller file in the, in the end. So how do you use this? You just um, specify the bootstrap 3 plugin in your application. And then you specify which JS files or JavaScript files you want. So instead of having a JavaScript file that maybe takes 200 kilobytes, you can just say that I really like the tooltip.js file and the dropdown. I don't care about all the rest. So then you get a smaller um, JavaScript file in the end. And one thing that's different from the, from the bootstrap you get from, for example, GitHub is that you can, I have bundled jQuery. Um, the version I'm bundling with this plugin will always uh, have the requirements that Bootstrap has. So you don't have to be worried that I final, uh, suddenly change it to jQuery 3, for example. That won't happen. Okay, so I want to show uh, the difference in uh, the development mode and the production mode. Let's see if I can pull this off. Mm. Can anyone read this? Is it better if I do? Is that better or? Just crazy anyway? Mm, okay. Then I'll just skip the code and I'll show you the, the, uh, the uh, HTML instead. Okay, so like Joel, I created my presentation using Modulicious as well. Uh, okay. Okay, so here you see, this is, now I'm running it in development mode with Morbo. And here you can see that there's four CSS files generated or included into the markup. So you have Prettify and you have the Impress demo and then you have Presentation and then some MD5, MD5 sum and you have Bootstrap. The reason why the Presentation and the Bootstrap files also have the MD5, MD5 sum even though you're running in, in development mode is because they have to be generated by SAS to be usable. So, if I change this into a production mode, then you see there's only one file. And we can see that it's minified and pretty difficult to read. There's also the JavaScript file, which is pretty difficult to read. I can show you the difference from development mode. So this is the development mode. So it's a lot easier to debug than this. Okay, so any questions? <laughs> 